welcome to Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Stan Osterman, coming to you, uh, not where my background is. Background's on the Big Island, but I'm actually back at my house in Kailua now. So it was a great trip to the Big Island I just finished. And uh, actually, we're going to throw up uh, the first picture. Um, I had a great trip to the Big Island. And what we did was we put, picked up the very first Toyota Mirai to be uh, landed on the Big Island. So the Big Island of Hawaii has its first hydrogen fuel cell car. That's Paul Pontio refueling at our Millennium Rain um, filling station that they have at Puuava in North Kona on, Hawaii, on the Big Island of Hawaii. And um, you can see on the refueling picture that it was all salt covered. The car is still full of uh, salt spray from coming over on the barge from Oahu. So thanks to Paul for helping uh, get that vehicle up there and putting some fuel in it. And, now we have a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle to show off to the folks on the Big Island. We're really excited to have it there. So thanks again, Paul, and all the folks that got it there and the folks down at Young Brothers did a great job. So today's show uh, is really kind of a flashback. Um, in the state of Hawaii or in Hawaii, um, we, we look at the culture of Hawaii and, and the thousands of years that it developed in the middle of the ocean isolated from most other places and the, the only connection they had was probably with other polynesian islands with occasional sailing canoes but no real trade it was totally sustainable hawaii was always sustainable and the population was not much different than it is today quite frankly um distributed maybe a little bit differently with uh, more people spread out across the state instead of mostly focused on oahu but sustainable they took care of themselves they had rules, they call them kapus, to make sure that people didn't overfish and to they had their own planting cycles with lunar calendars and things. And they did just great. So today's guest is Richard Ha from the Big Island, one of my good friends over there, who really sits down and, and talks to the other folks here in Hawaii that uh, we call them the kupuna, that, that have the stories and, and know the history of the islands here and the traditions that we have. And we're going to tie that together with energy and, you know, how that, that culture, that attitude uh, is still pervasive today in sustainability. So Richard, thanks for being with us. And I know you're still really active in the local community. And you're a big supporter of sustainable agriculture in particular, but sustainable activities in Hawaii. So uh, welcome. Just give us a little bit of background on where you see especially the Big Island today and, and our efforts to move towards a sustainable um, economy here in the state of Hawaii. Oh, okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah. Well, that was pretty exciting looking at that um, Mirai. Big deal. Yeah. Paul and, I were, Paul, Paul and I were excited. Even the lady down at Young Brothers that was uh, clearing us to take the car off the lot there was really excited when Paul told her that, was, that we're making history yesterday. <laughs> I, I'm going to hold you to what I asked you if I could uh, get a ride in that. <laughs> you can drive it, Richard. You can drive it. All right. Uh, yeah, let, let me give you a little bit of background of who I am and, and stuff like that. Um, my background is I, I actually am a Hawaiian, Korean, and uh, Okinawan, Japanese. And uh, I, I have a lot of uh, stuff I didn't really realize that came down through through. Uh, our family, I guess, we came from somewhere, um, knowledge, you know, and just basic feeling about stuff. But I was, you know, just like a lot of folks in my generation, we never learned how to uh, uh, speak Hawaiian, and we kind of fit in and, and adjusted to things as, as they came along. So, um, but but some of the, the stuff that I think about came from somewhere, and I think it came down through uh, our uh, three generations. And to give you an idea, what um, so our family had family land down at Maku uh, on the Big Island. That's between uh, Hawaiian Paradise Park and and Hawaiian beaches, and on the ocean. That's where our family land was. So they they had a very sustainable uh, um, situation there. They planted kalo, they they fished, and they were pretty much self sufficient. Um, so I, 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 I just had a, a sense of, of what that was like. So 
what happened to me was I, I ended up going to, well, let me describe what the, 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 the house there looked like. It had a green out, uh, colored wall and a red roof and the, 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 the foundation on which the piers were set up on were uh, beach rocks on Donna Beach. And they built the whole thing like that. And then there were piles of uh, maybe five Lahala mats to, to lie, sleep on, and uh, rolls of uh, uh, hala, cloud lahala for weaving. And uh, so they had a redwood water tank, and the redwood water tank had a filter, and the filter was boulder bags. You know what boulder bags are? I'm pretty sure you are. You yeah, do. from, from uh, tobacco. Right, right, exactly. So that, that's how things were, yeah? Then, then that was normal. And the person that influenced me the most was my great grandma. You know, because back then when we were little kids, 10 years old like that, she, she would just, uh, she was the most welcoming person I have ever met in my whole life. When kids came around, she was, you know, and she couldn't speak English, but, you know, and we'd hang with her all day long on the beach and stuff like that. And it, it, we never even, it never even occurred to us that <laughs> that was the case, but, um, but we understood each other very well. But anyway, that's, that's kind of my background. And uh, what happened to me was I started growing bananas. And then uh, I, I actually, I, I guess I should say, I, I got drafted, I plunked out of school, I got drafted, I went to the army, went to Vietnam, stayed for uh, seven years, decided I couldn't make a career of it because you needed a college degree after. So I decided to come back home. And that's when I decided to, to major in accounting. And it wasn't very complicated because I, want, I just wanted to keep score. That was the whole thing about accounting. So then I came back and then I started fitting myself into the, the culture here. And then we, you know, as we were going along, we, we started looking at growing bananas. And uh, at that time, it was being imported from Central America. And there seemed to be a good good uh, opening for us, you know, for us, because we actually grew bananas. We know a little bit about it. So we started doing that. And, and, and so that was my background. And then after we spent several years growing bananas, the, um, there was a, 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 back in 2007, we noticed our, our cost of, of uh, uh, supply is going up. And then after we looked at it really carefully, we realized it was due to byproduct of, of, of fossil fuel. And at that point, I said, oh boy, I better learn about this to kind of figure out how to position our business. So I went to the first of five uh, um, association for the study of well, and, and And that's where I started to pick up um, on what this, this, all this meant. So, so, okay, so I come back minding my own business. And then um, after I went to the second and third, I started to realize, holy smoke, this is serious information. And, you know, I didn't choose it. it you know, it, the kind of information I picked up became my kuleana, not, not, not because I wanted it. But it was because I was the only person from Hawaii there most of the time. And I look around, holy smokes now, what is my responsibility here? And it was to bring back uh, the best knowledge I could share with Hawaii people. But I'm not a scientist or, or an engineer. But what I could do was look around and try to determine who was uh, credible and who, who was it. You know, some people would be trying to sell you stocks and stuff like that. So we just kind of figured out who, who the credible people were. And one of the persons uh, I, I realized early on was very credible was this guy, Nate Higgins. And, and you talked to him, you know Nate, yeah? Yes, he's awesome. Um, yeah, so so I looked all around, up and down, every which way, and, and I decided, you know what, this guy is credible. Um, and then another guy I liked that was Charlie Hall. So I came back with that knowledge, and but I, you know, and the knowledge was uh, oil and 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 fossil fuel had had a, a definite uh, uh, life. It's not going to last forever. So, so knowing that and trying to spread and, and, and share that knowledge with people is kind of difficult because you don't want to really be saying the sky is falling. So, so I was trying to do the best I could all the way up until this pandemic. And then all of a sudden the pandemic hit and everybody started focusing on it. 
and uh, and and uh, climate change. But I already knew, and I was always scared of what would happen to us about the uh, fossil fuel. And so that's that's how I come to this whole discussion, yeah. And so so here I am with that knowledge, and uh, you know, I I, I started to. I was invited to give a presentation, five-minute presentation to the, uh, uh, the celebration of the Hawaiian Kingdom. That was back in April. And I was just asked to give a sustainability talk, five minutes. So I did that and it actually went across pretty well and gave me an opportunity to start to meet people in, in the uh, Kumulipo and that kind of a thinking. And, and then I started to you know, look at it and say, hey, wait a minute. The Hawaiians lasted for a thousand years. And we're worrying about if we're going to make it a hundred years, two hundred years. Yeah. So, 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 so maybe we can learn from them. So, because I gave that talk, I was able to connect with uh, some of the folks, you know, like uh, Kikuhi, uh, uh, Kelly, uh, Kanakaoli. So, so I. I was fortunate enough to, to uh, uh, participate in our class. And there I started to learn what was it that they were teaching. And it just blew me away because they were teaching that uh, basically man is, is part of the environment. You know, so you got to live in, in, in uh, harmony with, with the environment. And when you think about it that way, you say, no wonder they were able to survive. They, they had guardrails, you know. You know, when, when I took a look at it, 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 it was basically a physical science, ecology kind of economic system with a culture that was uh, developed to make that e economic system work. And it worked for a thousand years. So right off the bat, I thought, holy smokes, maybe, maybe we should kind of think about what is it about that that we could learn from. So anyway, that, that's how I got, that's a long okay. So, so, Richard, a, a quick question for you is, you know, for the audience, you actually did more than just banana farming on a small scale. You, you actually had a lot, large operation with refrigerated containers for, for food safety and you, you raised tomatoes as well. I mean, you're, you're, when we're talking about growing bananas, we're not talking about, you know, half an acre of, uh, you know, banana patch. You, you were on several hundred acres of, of land and a bunch of that was in bananas. and and it was a full process of, you know, exporting them to the neighbor islands and things like that. It wasn't, wasn't just for local consumption. But you have a unique perspective of growing up from on a subsistence, um, you know, family uh, plot uh, and watching how fossil fuel and importing of goods has raised the prices and how that is all connected, like you said, back to fossil fuels. that A lot of people don't see, like when I was, Small. I grew up here in Hawaii too. I remember buying gasoline when I'd go cut grass for like you know maybe thirty cents a gallon, something like that. And yeah. you know that people couldn't even fathom that today. But um, it, the fossil fuel lets us do a lot of work with machinery, whereas before it was more manpower intensive and individuals working together collectively as as a community to raise food and things like that. Yeah. Can, can you just talk a little bit about that dynamic of, of being, using more human power or more, you know, more involvement by the community in raising your own um, food and sustaining yourself? Yeah. So, so that, that is the, let, let, let me explain a little bit about uh, our farm. Yeah, we, we had, we, we still have 500 of these simple acres. And the reason that happened was because bananas take a lot of land. So we had to get that many acres to, get, to, to be able to produce the amount we produce. And we were producing like 6, 000, 6 million pounds annually of bananas. And, and then we shifted into tomatoes, you know, at the same time, we had both going. And the reason we did that was because tomatoes was more focused. It was more uh, higher end, uh, uh, commodity versus uh, bananas, which is low, low cost and maximum volume. So we did that. And we were producing about a million pounds of uh, tomatoes uh, annually. 
And I went to the University of Arizona Control Environment Ag uh, courses to, to learn about that. So we were actually, and, and you know how we decided to, with, in tomatoes, we, and we, we're, we're basically common sense people, yeah? It, it, it's not rocket science we're talking about. So when we decided that we were going into tom uh, uh, tomatoes, we started to look around and say, hmm, where should we go to look? And one of the places was England, because England is kind of dreary. Yeah, you're like Hilo. So we yeah. went over there. And then we looked at how they set up their uh, uh, houses and stuff like that. And it was very clever because they put the plastic over the, uh, uh, the frame and they tie it down with rope. And then if, if, uh, you know, if it, the wind blew unexpectedly really, really quickly, all you got to do is no, no forget where you put your knife and run out and cut all your, the strings, I mean, all the ropes. And then the, the plastic flies but the infrastructure stays. So that, that's, you know, just common sense stuff here. But anyway, that's, that's the background of, of how we got into doing what we're, we're doing. So like you said, we have all the experience in, in dealing with making sure that the, all, all the uh, uh, regulations were followed and stuff like that. But the bottom line is this, it's real simple. The pluses got to exceed the minuses or it's not sustainable. And it's not algebra because I got L D in algebra in high school. <laughs> no wonder I like you so much. We must be brothers. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so so that, that's how I, I come at this thing. So I, I do have some experience in practical, larger size operations. And I've always been concerned about how, how would, you know, s small farmers uh, manage in this today's world? Because it, it's way tougher today than it was when I started. It was actually pretty easy when I started. So that's what I'm really concerned about. And that's what we're facing. And, and the thing that I, I have come to the conclusion of, you know, that uh, Charlie Hall and, and, and Nate Higgins both talk about is physical science ecology as the basis for economic system. Uh, and, and that makes all sense in the world because if, you, if you're looking at natural science, you, you gotta, you know, uh, Science is, is 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 so that you don't end up fooling yourself. Yeah. So so um, anyway, that that's how my background is okay. and why. I... The um the Big Island has. I I, I want to try and quote Paul. He says, out of the ten or eleven known um, environment or ecologies there are on the planet, the Big Island has like eight of them. Uh, you got everything from snow-capped mountains to rainforest to desert. Um, uh, in your opinion, as a as a farmer and as an economist, how likely is it to be able to use that diverse climate on the Big Island to raise pretty much all of the kind of um, agriculture we need, uh, even including cattle um, and maybe lamb and sheep and things like that? Um, how viable is it for us to really be producing a lot more of those kind of things than bringing them in from the mainland? Yeah, and 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 the key is energy. And that's what uh, 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 Nate Higgins and, and uh, Charlie Hall talks about. It's all about energy because energy does work. It's, it's that simple. And, and it's based on a fire. You know, it's a, it, in, in your car, what runs your car. And it, everything you can think of originates at some place where there's a fire. And, and so how's that fire come about? Right now, we've been relying on uh, uh, fossil fuel you know, to get that uh, fire. Now... We're finding out that uh, we, the world probably hit the peak of uh, uh, world oil production, fossil fuel production in 2018. So the question then becomes, how much time do we have before we start to decline on, on the backside of the supply curve? And Charlie Hall guys and, uh, feel like uh, between 10 and 20 years. Now, if you think about 10 and 20 years, that's like, well, let's say 20 years, that's one generation. So a, a child born today, 25 years from now, will be 2046. It's one year after we're supposed to be all uh, on, on renewables, yeah? Right. But imagine what that's going to look like if you are depending on it to be uh, uh, solar. So let's say a solar farm is made the same day that child is born. Okay. So let's say it's 100 acres. It, that that uh, 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 solar 
uh, project will last for about 25 years, that's what we, we noticed. And then you've got to go out and, and get uh, whatever it takes to make another one like that. And, and they talk about rare earth minerals. Now, just, just think how many people, you know, trying to go to electric cars and how much uh, are, are wanting to, to, to get batteries to, to accomplish that. So rare earth minerals in 25 years is probably going to cost more than it costs today. And uh, what will that child look, be looking at 25 years from now? So at that point, the cost of the electricity would probably be more expensive. And then um, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to be a tough existence for the child uh, from there. I but, think, you know. I think you're right, Richard. And I think we're going to be using a lot more electricity than we do now because I, I, I tell people that my, my house, thanks to Nate telling me about energy blindness, my house uses about 21 kilowatt hours of electricity a day. And with the kind of traveling I do, I, I calculated that I would use about between 25 and 30 kilowatt hours in my car drive or my truck driving you know, around uh, to go shopping and to go to work and things like that. So that, that means I'd have to have you know, probably a total production of at least 45 or 50 kilowatt hours of production over a five hour day because I get pretty decent sunlight here. So maybe 10 kilowatts of, of power on my house just to sustain myself. And I think that if we, if we tried to um, you know, calculate that into everybody, and, and some people don't have houses. They live in apartments. They, they rent. They, uh, you know, they don't have that capacity to put, just put it on their roof. Um, that means an awful lot of solar panels, like you said, have a limited life expectancy. So. But, but Hawaii has more than just sunshine and, and wind. You know, we have geothermal as well. And I think that um, one of the challenges that we find is that um, there's kind of a resistance to some of the new technology that's out there. For example, nuclear power. I can't imagine nuclear power being here in Hawaii just because of the, the pushback that the community would give. Um, but geothermal is one of those ones that we actually have a, a real potential for as long as we can have it mesh with the culture and our, our historic background on sustainability. How do you think that could work in Hawaii? Uh, I, I think it'll be uh, excellent. I, I think this is our solution, you know, and, and uh, this will set us uh, apart from, from G, the U.S. mainland and everything. Uh, in, imagine it like this. The, the, the geothermal will, will last for 500,000 to a, a million years, practically forever. And the cost of the heat that we, we, we need to get to generate electricity will not change. So in other words, all we got to do is wait, and we'll have the advantage over uh, uh, the U.S. mainland. And here's why. Because everybody is worried about uh, uh, fossil fuels, so they're converting. Um, one of the big places they want to convert is to hydrogen. But 90 something percent of the hydrogen they make is based on natural gas. Natural gas is a finite resource. Uh, in other words, the price is going to go up. You know, I, I just saw in the last week the price went up and, and uh, quite, quite, a, quite a bit. Um, yet at the same time, you, know, you don't have to go out and, and bid for the uh, solar panels with, with the uh, geothermal, and you don't have to worry about getting rid of the rubbish. The end of life right yeah yeah so so if we had the, the all of the heat power of uh Manipale of the geothermal um we could be making hydrogen um maybe even converting it to uh, ammonia or liquid hydrogen and even exporting energy where hawaii right now is a totally dependent on external energy coming in in either oil or even up for the next couple of months anyway coal a lot of people don't realize we actually have one coal burning power plant here on, on Oahu. And in the old days, we used on Maui, they used to burn the leftover sugar cane. They call it bagas, and they would make electricity from bagas. But, you know, we, we have the potential with geothermal and with solar and wind to produce a lot more energy than Hawaii needs for its own um, 
electrical generation and transportation even. So do you think that's viable to, to really, like, use, like you say, use hydrogen to ship energy to Oahu, say, which has a bigger population center and less ability to produce its own um, renewable solar and wind? Um, would that be a viable thing? I think so, but um, I, I, I am more focused specifically on, on geothermal, and I'm looking specifically at the Big Island to, to, to make sure that we're, uh, 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 we're focused on it. We gotta have a strong electric uh, grid. Um, because, you know, having been in this, uh, I am president of the Hawaii Island uh, Energy Corps, and, and uh, we, we also were involved in trying to buy AGI out many years ago. Um, yeah, yeah, so I, I think, you know, and, and from the experience of, of that, people were asking us, oh, what, what about us? What about us here on the island? You guys are all thinking about cables, this and that and everything. And, you know, when I think about it, I think they're right. I think the best thing we can do is make sure we got it and we get it going and we start uh, uh, doing what we need to do. And, and if it comes about that they need the, 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 uh, the power on Oahu, then let's have a discussion with the whole community, everybody. Okay, you guys want, okay, sure, let's talk about it. Because, you know, it makes sense. When I look at Oahu, they, 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 I'm sure they're gonna need it sometime, but I don't know in what form or anything. Our job is to make sure we, 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 we have it uh, uh, um, solid, you know, and, and so how's that look? Well, we've been asking uh, the Hawaii Groundwater Geothermal Resource Center, you know, uh, Nicole Lopsy and Tom, uh, uh, Don Thomas. Uh -huh. And, and uh, you know, we, we asked, what would it take to evaluate the geothermal resource on Hawaii Island uh, for our five volcanoes? And, you know, he, he gave me an estimate of something, you know, around 22 million. And for that, you would be able to do an uh, uh, assessment, ground assessment of where the heat is and stuff like that. Then you, have, then you can determine if it's close to, too close to the population or and all the other issues. And then you start to determine, okay, these are the diff different possibilities. But we got to do that ahead of time, not when uh, the utility asks, Oh, we're going to open up a, uh, a geothermal uh, RFP, you know, uh, request for proposals. Um, it was just too late, you know. It's it's the, right. the risk is all up front. If you drill a right. hole, cost you several million, and you get nothing, you know. So well, you know, you should, you, that, that's yeah. a good point, Richard. Especially right now with uh, with the funding that's becoming available because of COVID and infrastructure improvements. Um, is anybody talking to Senator Schatz and Senator Hirono about uh, trying to capture some of that for geothermal? You know, before it's like, you know, hey, we need it to, today, but we needed to start five years ago to put it together. Yeah, you know, and I think, you know, a key person will be Senator uh, 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 Representative Kahele. Because, uh, Kahele? He, yeah, because um, he's a, a native Hawaiian, the only native Hawaiian. And our uh, energy, no, I'm sorry, the interior uh, our secretary, Deb Holland, is, is, is Native American. You know, so, so she more apt to listen to what Kai has to say. So he is very important in this whole discussion. And because we're working with uh, uh, an understanding of, uh, you know, what uh, anti-poor folks are teaching, we, we are trying to be very respectful of how we do this so that we have, you know, uh, community buy-in, uh, uh, and, and we got to do it for the right reasons. It's not not just for uh, to make money, because that's not what we're talking about. I, I think you hit the, the nail on the head, and it's a good point to close, because we're up against our time now. But, you know, doing it for the right reasons is what it's all about. We call we call it being Pono in Hawaii, and it, it's doing the right thing for the right reason. And I think you're right. Kai Kahele, his dad was a state senator. He's He was one of the pilots in the Air National Guard when I was in the Air National Guard, and he's, uh, he still flies, um, but he's focusing on his congressional work. You're right, he's probably the right guy to go to. So Richard, thanks so much for uh, being on the show today. And uh, we'll have to have you back in a, in a little bit after you have your drive in uh, Mirai.
and uh, we'll get a report back from you on that. So okay, until next shoot. week. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Until next week, Stan Energy Man signing off. Aloha. <laughs>